So this morning, um, we're continuing into our journey into the book of Mark. And, um, you know, this is going to be an adventure for us and a journey for us together as we look at the life and the teachings of Jesus through this, this gospel of Mark. And um, today our uh, text is going to be found in the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 16 to 28. And I've entitled today's message, Fishers of Men and Overcomers of Evil. And I find it very interesting that we land upon this day um, on October the 31st. God has something specific to say about what's happening in the world today and specific to say what he uh, has to say about this day. So once Jesus Christ, our Lord, was baptized, he had to run a gauntlet of temptations from the devil in the desert. And he went from that time of testing and, and temptation, um, he went that time into the desert surrounding the Jordan River. And it was in the center of the Roman province of Galilee. And at the heart of Galilee was a place where uh, fresh water flowed from an inland sea, into an inland sea from the Jordan River. And it had its source um, in the hills surrounding uh, the land of Israel uh, and the mountain where the Jordan River has its source is called Mount Hermon. And it's on the very north end of the land of Israel. Now, according to uh, the historian Josephus, the province of Galilee in that day, in the day of Christ, it consisted of 208 or 212, there's two different uh, renderings here, villages, which included the, the, the place where Jesus had grown up. He grew up in the town of Nazareth, a very inconspicuous little dot on the map. And... Um, According to the historian Josephus, the province of Galilee had these 208 or 210 villages, including this town of Nazareth. And the hill areas surrounding um, Nazareth uh, was a place where farmers would cultivate and raise their crops. Um, but many people in the region lived in towns and villages along the lake shore where pre the pro predominant industry of the day was fishing, and, and, and it was called the Sea of Galilee. Um, Jesus grew up in this region, and, and he knew the people, he knew the culture very well. You might well consider uh, Galilee kind of like uh, the Caribou Regional District, uh, compared with Jerusalem being compared to uh, the city of Kamloops. Actually very similar in size, to tell you the truth, in population in those days. So, so it's here in this place that Jesus begins his earthly ministry. And if you have your Bibles with you, would you please turn with them into the book of Mark, chapter 1, starting with verse 16, and we'll have it on the overhead here if you want as well. But our text today is Mark Chapter 1, 16 to 28. Reading from verse 16. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and they followed him. And when he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Now, when we look at this first part of the passage of Scripture that is our text today, it's very interesting that the first disciples of Jesus 
were the closest disciples to him, and they were all fishermen. Isn't that interesting? Now, John Mark does not outline the miracle that Jesus did surrounding the call of these first disciples as we see in the book of Matthew or even Luke and John. Um, but I think that it's worth pondering why Jesus chose fishermen to be his first disciples. Why did Christ use men such as these to be his first disciples to plant his church? Now, we can't, we can't doubt that this choice was deliberate. And through his life and teachings, the Lord Jesus Christ, he, he brought honor to many professions. For example, the carpenter, right? He was a carpenter, a builder. The gardener and the shepherd. And clearly, Jesus saw the dignity of honest work done by ordinary people. But these men, these other men, are make, maker, mar, makers and protectors, I guess you could say. They nurture living things and, and, and make use of the fruits. They're not human predators like the fishermen are. Nevertheless, Christ selected commercial fishermen to be his first emissaries to the world. Isn't that interesting when you think about that? When you read the account of this miraculous calling in the other Gospels, um, Jesus called his followers to be fishers of men. And I believe, however, we can understand this better if we consider what it takes to be a fisher of fish. So what is it like in the first century to be a fisher of fish in the context of the setting? It's been said by a certain writer that a fisherman, particularly one who commercially fishes the seas, he reaches across worlds, inserting himself with skill and cunning into a world that no human can inhabit. This trade attracts a certain kind of a person. Now, I believe that Jesus called out to fishermen for a number of reasons. The careful observation of a trained fisherman is actually a marvel. Through learned and, and, and practiced skill, that was passed on to him by his father and his brethren before him. Or from mentors of the trade that were working the trade before them. The fishermen must reach into unfamiliar territory, finding the fish where they are. Now, one of the things with commercial fishermen, and specifically in this day and age, is that those commercial fishermen... They knew how to take orders. Over the years of development, they learned to take orders from those who had more experience than they have. Commercial fishermen learned to work very closely together under an authority structure. Particularly in that day, they were working together. It was all manual labor. The nets were hauled up by hand. The sails were set by hand. And it took a crew of them to be successful. This structure ensures crew safety and success. They know that catching fish or not may just be the difference between putting the nets on one side of the boat versus the other. Skilled, skilled fishermen listen to the advice given to them by even more experienced fishermen. And in doing so, they hone their existing skills and they build new ones. And they become really good at their profession. Now when Jesus told the men to follow him, he had asked them to become fishers of men. And while there's time, for questioning and debating, fishermen have learned that sometimes the difference between failure and success on the water is just a matter of the width of their boat even. They know how to take orders from the master fishermen. And when Jesus said, cast their net on the other side of the boat, his disciples listened without questioning. Christians too 
need to develop the skill of taking orders from the Lord. It's okay to ask questions, but sometimes situations call for simply taking the order and listening. With the miraculous catch of fish that Jesus showed to them as a sign As evidenced in the other Gospels, it's not talked about here, but in the other Gospels, it was given as a sign. Peter, Andrew, James, and John knew that they were dealing with a master fisherman in the Spirit when they were dealing with the Lord Jesus Christ. I think Peter fell down before him. (laughs) I'm a sinful man. Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man because they knew with all their skill over the years, there was no catch. And Jesus said, take your nets and let them down for a catch. And there was a catch so large that they could hardly contain the catch in their boats. Peter was a master fisherman, I'm sure. And he knew when he saw a miracle And he knew when he saw the Lord God Almighty speaking to a circumstance. And he was overwhelmed. With the miraculous catch of fish that Jesus showed to them as a sign, Peter, Andrew, James, and John knew that they were dealing with a master fisherman in the spirit. Because they were new to the call to follow this master, they realized that they had very little skill in the job that they were being called to by him. And because of the character, they recognized that they needed to be disciples and they needed to learn. They were ready to obey when Jesus called out to Peter and Andrew, come, follow me in verse 17. Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once, they left their nets and followed him. And when Jesus called out to James and John in verse 20, without delay, he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. See, in addition to knowing how to take orders. Commercial fishermen know how to work hard and they've learned to work together. They're not afraid of getting their hands dirty. They're not not afraid to get into it. And they've learned to think through the eyes of the fish that they are trying to catch and adjust their methods accordingly, even if this means an extraordinary amount of toil. But they also realize that sometimes the fish do what they want, and they can do nothing about it. Manually pulling in a, a, a net full of fish is hard, hard work. Everybody on the boat works together. It's not like in the days where they hit a button, and those guys still work hard, don't get me wrong, but they hit a button and the net goes up with a winch. No, these men worked together and pulled it in by hand to accomplish the goal. They don't let any one person do the work as they sit and watch. That's not how it works. And this is one of the reasons why Jesus called fishermen to be his inner circle. The commercial fishermen are dedicated to the tasks associated to their trade. They've been taught tenacity in pursuit of their quarry. And loads of patience discovering the value of continuing their quest to find and catch these fish where other people would give up. Fishermen are not salesmen. You ever been down on the docks and talked to commercial fishermen? You realize they're not salesmen. Sometimes they're actually rather blunt. (laughs) I remember as a young man going down to the docks and talking to some commercial fishermen and they're, they're an interesting crew, to say the least. But the ones that are God-fearing carry the same characteristics, only tapered with the power 
of the Holy Spirit in them. They're courageous. They're a courageous lot. They're not afraid to take chances, to cast away from familiar places, to dip their nets where no man has ventured before. They're not fair weather dependent in their toiling, only going into the deep when conditions are perfect. For me, as a sports fisherman, if it's blustery out there, I kind of look at it and go, maybe another day. But to the commercial fisherman whose livelihood depends upon it, bringing in a catch, they ignore the weather sometimes. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they have to pull in. But a lot of times they're out there in very, very difficult conditions. Fishermen are not salesmen. They're hard-working and tenacious hunters. They're courageous. They're not afraid to chance the, uh, the waves and the wind around them, to cast away from the familiar places, to dip their nets in those places where there could be fish, but they have never charted it. They've learned not only to deal with the elements of wind and storm coming against them full force, but once accustomed to it, even though they understand they are at the mercy of the elements of the powerful sea that surrounds them, they are thriving in that environment. They are alive in that environment. A truly good commercial fisherman is adventurous and courageous in heart. When the fish are out to, at sea to be caught, they are always studying the charts and the structure of the environment, which will help them to catch more fish. An ancient mariner, generally speaking, now there's always exceptions because people are people, right? And you get all kinds. But ancient mariners were not typically cocky and full of themselves. They understood how small they were and how small their crew was in the light of the vast expanse of the sea before them and how really fragile life was. They, they knew how to control certain things, but most of the circumstances that they were cast out upon were really beyond their control. And for this reason, y you see it in ancient mariners. Uh, um, they were deeply religious men. You, you heard the story of Jonah and the whale, right? Those mar Deeply religious men. Why? Why? Because they see the power of the elements around them and they realize they have no control over the environment that they're in. For this reason, they, um, in p the pagan nations, they placed carvings of their deities often at the front of their boat, the bow of their boat, as they're carving into the great unknown. Calling out on their gods to protect them as they went out and were at the mercy of the weather. And the, the, the demeanor of the sailor made them very much aware of how small they were in comparison with what is before them in the creation. Now, the Bible says in Hebrews 13 that nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid before him, laid before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. God understands everything. He knows the east from the west and the north from the south and everything that happens under the sun. They kn he knows it. And these men, these fishermen, were deeply religious. Now the, the Jewish men were following the Lord God Almighty, the one true God who created the heavens and the earth. Other fishermen from different countries clung to idols and they, they looked to different deities that were not in fact God. But the Bible tells us there are no other gods to lead mankind through the storms of life. There is in reality only one, and that is the God, the Lord God of Israel, who is also the Lord of over all creation. And the Jewish children in the day of Jesus um, would recite the passages of Scripture. One of the passages of Scripture that they would recite daily um, was in Deuteronomy 6. At the start of every day. And, and in this passage, Moses told the people, Deuteronomy 6, he said this. 
These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing into the Jordan to possess. So that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all of his decrees and commands that I give you so that you may enjoy long life. Hear Israel and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. These commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. The Jewish children of that day were very familiar with this passage of Scripture. So the fishermen whom Jesus called to be his disciples would have been taught this passage of Scripture from childhood. Peter, Andrew, James, and John understood dependence upon God to protect them, to lead them to a place of success. Is it any wonder why Jesus chose God-fearing fishermen to lead the charge of the venture that he was launching? He could have chosen other men, right? He could have chosen other men, men with more education, men with more outward appeal. But Jesus went looking for leaders amongst the rank of men who had soft hearts towards God. That's what he was looking for. Man looks to the outside, but God looks to the heart. Men who understood adversity and had developed character to press through hardships in the storms that came in life, even when the waves were crashing crashing against the vessels that they were manning in the great deep of the unknown. Men look to the outside. Many others likely would have chosen Pharisees or zealots, intellectuals, or even soldiers to lead the charge. But Jesus, he chose, who did he choose? He chose as his inner circle, as the ones who would be his leaders. He chose commercial fishermen to be the leaders of the 12 core disciples who would revolutionize the world with the message that he gave them. But it was more than just the skills that Jesus saw inside of them. Their hearts were soft towards God. Jesus asked them to follow him. This invitation shows us what true Christianity is all about. Jesus was the master fisherman. They recognized that when they saw how they were failing and they were seasoned men. And they saw how Jesus said, put your nets over here. And there was a bursting catch in that net so full that it was sinking the boats. They recognized that they were dealing with someone who was a master fisherman. And when Jesus asked them to follow him, they abandoned everything and they followed him. Jesus knew that the tough times were coming for his church to start and for all those who were in leadership, they would go through it. They would go through it. It would be hard. It wouldn't be easy. This invitation shows us what true Christianity is all about. It's not about specifically about theological systems, although they're included. It's not about rules, yet there are rules. Or even charity towards people. That's all part of it. But what it is, is learning to take orders from Jesus and marching in the direction that he calls you to and doing it with resolve, with all abandonment of yourself. Following Jesus. All of the other stuff adds into it, but following Jesus. Jesus knew that the going would be tough sometimes for those who would follow him. In the start of the ministry, Jesus faced opposition from the devil who tried his best to tempt him to sin and throw him off of his mission. Just before this, Jesus was in the desert preparing for his ministry and he was cast into a place where he was tested and tempted by the devil. And more than anyone, Jesus understood that leadership and 
His leadership team in the church would be difficult at times. It would be tough at times. And they needed the qualities, and he needed the qualities of these fishermen. He, he chose them because that was his plan, because he wanted them to help him establish his work. He knew this because they would be facing the powers of darkness, which were more powerful than they were standing by themselves. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, praise the Lord. Amen? There is no power of hell that can overcome the church because the church is the bride of Christ and he is at the helm. And no weapon formed against his church shall prosper. Thus saith the Lord in his word and it will be true to the very end of the age. So you can be sure that the ones who have walked before you have become examples to us because they followed the master and the master took them along and took care of them. And he's going to take care of you too. More than anyone, Jesus understood his leadership team needed the qualities of these fishermen because they indeed would be facing the powers of darkness together as the mission moved forward on a parallel track. It takes discernment and tremendous humility to bring the gospel into another person's life the way that God is honored. Each of us can take stock today and follow Jesus just as his first disciples did. We must follow each trail where it leads, always focusing on the other person and not on ourselves. Understanding the consequences may be painful and unforeseen. And like a fisherman, we must ultimately see that fishing for men is ultimately in God's hands, not ours. When the four disciples spoken of here in Mark left their nets to follow Jesus, they clearly had no sense of where they were going or how their journey would ultimately end, but they abandoned it all for the sake of the call because they recognized a master fisherman when they saw him, and he asked them to become fishers of men. They abandoned everything for the sake of his call on their lives. Just look at that passage where Jesus called to the sons of Zebedee. They just walked and said, we're going to follow the master. You have a call on your life here this morning too. Are you willing to abandon it all for the sake of his call on you? As exampled or exemplified by the, the first disciples? Are you willing to give, to love, to serve the master with everything that you are and everything that you have? This is a question that is posed to you. And I, and I dare say that it's posed to you by the Holy Spirit through his word this morning. Do you want a piece of your life just to hold on to it? God can have everything but this. God wants you to abandon it all for the sake of a call, of the call, all to him, all to Jesus. Billy Graham once had this at his crusades, all to Jesus, I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee my blessed Savior, I surrender all. This is the cry of the heart of God that needs to be beating in his people's chest. Never will he leave you. Never will he forsake you. He'll be with you to the very end of the age, like fishermen. When we get out there, we ultimately see that fishing for men is ultimately in God's hands, not ours. When these four disciples spoke, uh, spoken of here in Mark, that when they left their nets to follow Jesus, they clearly had no sense of where or how their journey would ultimately end, but they understood what he was calling them to, and they abandoned everything for the sake of his call in their lives. Are you willing to abandon it all for the sake of his call on you? Are you willing to give, to love, to serve the master with everything that you are and everything that you have, regardless of what the cost is? 
In the flesh, we can't do this. But God has given us another advocate, a comforter, one who gives us strength to do what we cannot do. The Holy Spirit calls today, abandon my children. Abandon it all for the sake of my call on you. I pray that the example set by the first disciples would be the lead that we follow here at Hillside Community Church. So here in Mark, the journey of Jesus and his, his disciples, they begin. It begins, sorry, rather, not they begin. It begins. Almost, almost right out of the gate, what happens? Almost right out of the gate. No sooner had they been called to follow the Lord than what happens? Guess what? They have to face the opposition in the form of demons. They went to Capernaum, it says in verse 21. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, Who is this? What is this? Sorry. A new teaching? And with authority, he even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. So immediately after calling the first disciples to follow him, Jesus led his followers into Capernaum. And Capernaum was the hometown of the fishermen he'd called, by the way. Now they went to the synagogue and Jesus began to teach the people. They were used to hearing messages from rabbis and teachers of the law who were, who were teaching and quoting third-party quotes all over the place. But Jesus began teaching in first person with authority. They were not used to this. In their religious assembly, um, there was this guy who was possessed by an evil spirit. Isn't it interesting that a man was possessed by the evil spirit in the synagogue? that was dedicated to worshiping Jehovah God. The Spirit tried to disrupt Jesus Christ's teaching, but Jesus demonstrated his authority to the disciples and all the people watching. He commanded this wicked spirit to come out of the man, and the Spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. Now, we see the ha season of Halloween. It's Halloween today. The season of Halloween's on us. The power of evil and darkness are celebrated in part, and I believe they're celebrated in part because people know that there is truth to it. There is evil in the world, but they don't know what to do with it because evil spirits do not listen to the ordinary man. They, they do what they want. They cause trouble wherever they are present. People understand this by seeing the evil in the world around them. Maybe they've been preyed upon by evil men led by evil spirits. And in an effort to make their presence light and to remove the sting of the reality of their existence, people try to dress it up as a myth and a legend that only exists in the subconscious mind and is not real. That's what it's all about. But I, I tell you today that demonic, demonic entities are very real. We struggle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness in high places. The scripture tells us this. They are real and they are around us and they do not like it when we share the gospel with other people because their, their mission is interrupted in stealing people's souls and seeing them, them uh, destroyed. That's, that's their mission. But the Bible shows us here in Mark that the authority that Jesus has over evil is overpowering. There is nothing evil that can stand against the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is Lord over all. And Jesus was showing his disciples the authority that was in his name because one day these fishermen would go out in his name and would establish the church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And today the work continues because the Lord is coming soon but we're still in the church age and it's still the same today. Although the enemy 
comes at us like a flood, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ because Jesus is Lord over heaven and over earth. He's Lord over all. And when we encounter the darkness, we best remember that. And sometimes we forget. We get overwhelmed when the darkness seems to be gaining an upper hand over us, over our lives, over our mission. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Amen? Jesus Christ is Lord over all. He's Lord over this assembly. He's Lord over the work that we do in his name. We do not belong to ourselves. We're purchased with a price, with the, bought with the precious blood of Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, which is not our own. It is the living God who has chosen to inhabit his people. You are ambassadors of the Most High God. Don't ever forget it. The name that you stand behind is the name that is above every name. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the spirit of Christ that lives in you is more powerful than the spirit of this world or of the dark ages. No matter how loud they roar, they cannot, they cannot do anything to you unless permitted. Demonic entities are real. They're all around us. They don't like it when we're sharing the gospel with people. Because it interrupts their mission of stealing people's souls and seeing their lives uh, destroyed. They love it. They're going to do what they can to get people's eyes off the real battle and onto pseudo battles that aren't really the real issue. Isn't that the day and age that we're living in? Distractions everywhere trying to throw the church of Christ away from understanding what really is the issue. The issue is that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities and powers of darkness in high places, and Jesus Christ has given us authority in his name to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the devil. Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We can't forget this, people. We can't forget it because the enemy comes at us like a flood, but the Lord Jesus Christ is Lord over all things, and when he says leave, they must leave in the name of Jesus because his name is higher than their name. His name is higher than any other name that can be called on. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord over all. And we as a church are part of the bride of Christ we speak as ambassadors of the Most High God, and we cannot forget this. We cannot forget this. And we cannot let it throw us to reaction against the evil of this world in a way that is flesh-driven rather than driven by the Spirit because God says something and it happens. We can try all day long and fight all day long to do what we want to do and what we want to see accomplished. And it will not happen because we cannot overcome this on our own strength. It is greater is, that is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Not greater is me that is in me than he that is in the world. You're not going to fight effectively against the powers of darkness out there in your flesh. It's not going to happen. It's only when you come under the, ba the ba banner of Christ that there is victory. The disciples were given this example by Jesus to prove a point. He was sending them out, and one day he'd be ascended, and they would go out. And guess what? You and I are the great, 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 great grandchildren of those men. We built, we built on the foundation that is the rock of Christ and the established foundation of his apostles and prophets. And the church rises on top of that as a building that is alive, a place where God dwells. Don't you forget that. Jesus Christ is your master. He is your protector. He is your provider. The gates of hell tremble at the name of Jesus. And you are his child. You are his ambassador. Jesus has freedom for people that are bound by the chains of darkness. In Jesus, there is healing. Jesus has given his disciples, including us today, his authority 
to go out in his name and proclaim the good news. And what is that? In Luke 9, 1 to 6, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out demons, all demons, not just demons, all demons, and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, leave their town and shake off the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. I realize this is a case-specific example, folks, but the principles are the same. When you're called by God to stand and take a stand, don't be afraid. The Lord your God is with you. Nothing can overcome you. Nothing will happen to you outside of God permitting it. If God permits that you should be a martyr for him, it will be. And there will be a reward in heaven for that. But don't forget, the Lord is master over everything that takes place. There's nothing taken him by surprise in this culture, in this day and age when everybody's going crazy. Nothing's taken him by surprise. As a matter of fact, he's permitting it so that we can see the reality of where we stand. It's like the onion skins being peeled off. Finally, before leaving the earth, the Lord, after he had been crucified and raised from the dead, he commissioned his disciples. He commissioned them permanently, giving them his authority to do what he called them to do. And what did he call them to do? In John chapter 20, 19 to 22. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with all the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After this, he said, after, the, after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. After this, Jesus Christ was with those disciples, walked with them for 40 more days. Acts, give, Acts 1 gives an account of this and how Jesus prepared them for his departure. In Acts 1, we read the account of Luke as to what took place. And it reads this, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day which he was taken up. After he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also predestined, or presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, and speaking of all the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or season which the Father has put in by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So we see the apostles went forward and they planted the church of Jesus Christ throughout the nations. And each of them received the death penalty in the flesh, except for John, who was boiled in oil and survived. But all the rest of them were martyrs for the Lord. We are the legacy. We are the ones who were built upon an everlasting foundation set in place by the Father with Jesus as the chief cornerstone and the apostles and prophets of, of old as the foundation. But the apostles passed on the authority of Jesus to us as Jesus had passed on to them. In James 4, 7, it's written this. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's authority in Jesus' name. That's been given to those who believe. We have no authority over Satan, people, and his dominion in ourselves. If we try in the flesh to raise a, a, an army up and go marching against the darkness and saying, we're not going to take it anymore. We're not going to take it anymore. 
We're not going to take it anymore. Guess what's going to happen to us? We're going to get flattened and kicked back onto our keister. Because we're standing in our own fleshly strength. Jesus said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's greater is he that is in you. In you. Who is in you? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, it's none other than the Holy Spirit of God who has been given. Jesus said, I send you another comforter. He comforts us. Even when we're in the midst of adversity, he's with us. His strength is given to us. These apostles, when they died for Christ, the stories are out there. You can read it. This how they, each of them died. They didn't die pitiful death screaming for mercy. <laughs> they died knowing they were going to a better place. Knowing that the worthy one had, called the, had counted them worthy to suffer for his name's sake. This is not natural. This is the work of the Spirit. God's Spirit establishes his church, people. God decides how things turn. We don't decide how that goes. Submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It may look like, you know, the devil gained an upper hand when he killed the, when he had the apostles uh, executed, but it was God allowing that. He allowed it because the church has been built on the blood of the martyrs. And Jesus Christ will make everything right one day. You have heard from me. It says, I, He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the season which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So the apostles went forward. They planted the church of Jesus Christ throughout the nations. We are benefactors of that today. You are a direct descendant of everything that took place back then. We're their legacy. We're the ones who have built upon this everlasting foundation set in place by the Father with Jesus as the chief cornerstone and the apostles and prophets of old as the foundation. But the apostles passed on the authority of Jesus to us. He passed on to us what Jesus had passed on to them. In James 4, 7 is written this. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. See? Our enemy cannot win against the Lord Jesus Christ. Greater is he that is in me and you, if you are a believer, than he that is in the world. And if you're not a believer, God's calling you today to surrender your life to him. We have no authority over Satan, over his dominion, in ourselves. If we try, we're going to fall flat on our face. But God has all authority, and he fights on our behalf. Satan will attack us, that's for sure. We're the apple of God's eye. We're going to face the powers of darkness that have possessed and infiltrated humanity that is a sure thing. But the authority that has been given to us in Jesus' name is authority that comes from the Lordship of Christ himself. Our response to the devil's attack should include submitting our lives to the Lord. Submitting our lives to him, bowing to him, living in a way that is honoring him, and responding to the enemy when he comes and tries to keep us from advancing the gospel in the way that Jesus Responded, and how, we, how do we do that? You wrestle not against flesh and blood, folks, but against principalities and powers of darkness. It's time for the church to arise and fall on its knees. There is no weapon formed against us that shall prosper when we are under the protection of the Lord. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. But we can't go about fighting this battle in the way of the flesh. We can't go out there on a crusade of our own doing and expect to be triumphant over the powers of darkness. It will not happen. It never did happen that way, and it will not happen. 
It is only when we submit to the Lordship of Christ and we call on his name and we put on the full armor of God and we take the sword of the Spirit in hand that we will be victorious. This is not of ourselves. The Lord is calling us to surrender, not to grab up and take on our own terms. He's calling us to surrender to his Lordship, to fight the good fight of faith on our knees. The reason why we get pummeled so badly sometimes is because the prayerlessness greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He's in you. You believe in Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord God Almighty lives within you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You don't have to fear the scorpions and the snakes and the powers of the wicked one. You can walk in peace and know that God is with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. He will be with you to the very end of the age. He's called us on a mission, and the mission is to shine brightly in this dark time, not to pick up our own sword and to fight on our own terms. We bow our knee to Christ, and we call upon him who is able to do much more than we can even ask or imagine. The disciples, they tried to catch fish all night with their skills, and they were skilled. And they never caught a single fish until they asked the master to, to, to help them. Until they submitted to the master and listened to the master, and the master said, put your nets here. They didn't catch a single fish. We want to see people come to Christ. It's going to be on God's terms, not ours. We have to learn to take orders. We have to submit to the master. I know that's totally against our nature. We want to do it our own way. That's how we're raised. That's how we're taught. But that's not the way of the cross. The way of the cross is surrender. The way of the cross is humbling ourselves before the mighty hand of God. He will lift you up in due time. Cast all of your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. He cares for his church. He wants his church to go forward and advance. But to advance, we must take orders from on top. We must be willing to do it on his terms, not our own. My friends, put on the full armor of God. It's time for us to take the full armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. I repeat this again. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Let that sink in, folks. We need to all let that sink in. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against flesh and blood. We need to get this. It is against principalities and powers of darkness. Authorities against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. Folks, everything I'm saying here today, please don't get me wrong. I'm going... I need to get this, because I don't get this. I mean, sometimes I get it, yeah. But oftentimes I don't get it. I let the circumstances overwhelm me, and I get all anxious about stuff that I can't control, and I'm like, oh, what's going on? I can't do anything about this. Look at the troubles that are before us. Ah, you know? And then you have a mind melt. And God's like, hey, cast your anxieties upon me, my son. Stop trying to carry this on your own. I, don't you believe that I have everything under my control? You don't have to be afraid of the scorpions and the snakes and all the things out there because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You're my son. You're my child. You're with me. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. I'll be with you to the very end of the age. So don't get your mind set on the things of this world and get worried about things that you can't control because I am the Lord. And I will have the final say. Get behind the Lord and his work 
and pour yourself into it. And God will open doors. He will close doors. He will protect you. And if it's your time to go home, you'll receive a warm welcome into the kingdom of heaven. Wow. See, friends, today we can learn things from the start of Jesus' ministry. He called his disciples to be leaders in the church, to set an example for us to follow. As Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So we ought to follow the examples of these first disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, as they were called to follow Christ. They abandoned it all for the sake of the call. They heard the voice of Jesus. They were fishermen who had a teachable spirit. God calls us to be fishermen with a teachable spirit as well. They knew how to take orders from the authority of the one who was more experienced, and that was the Lord, because he knew it all. And they knew that they were little grasshoppers compared to him. Follow me as I follow Christ. So we ought to follow the examples of these disciples too. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. They had a teachable spirit. They knew how to take orders. As fishers of men, they took instruction from the master fishermen and instructed others to follow them as they had learned from the Lord. And it's been passed down from generations to generations to generations right to where we're sitting right here today. We're part of this legacy that has been given. The first disciples, the apostles, were hardworking, tenacious, courageous, and patient fishers of men's souls. We would do well to imitate them as they imitate Christ. May God give us the strength to endure the hardship of this day along with them in the midst of the afflictions that come. Our enemy, the devil, and his vile companions roam the earth seeking whom they would devour, but God is with us just as he was with the first disciples. Don't doubt that for a moment. He is with you people. He is with me. We don't have to fear the darkness because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. You can start to look at this as a test, yes, but don't be overwhelmed and don't let the, let the darkness discourage you. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He's the master of our, everything. He's given us authority to tread on snakes and scorpions in Jesus' name and see people freed from the chains that bind. Amen.